initially the faculty ran the university. Then the Board of Regents reached a point where they said we need a president. They hired Henry Tappan, came from New York State, and he wanted to create a whole new kind of university, unlike anything that had been done in this country. And for that, he said we need to do science. We need to do real science. President Tappan arrives uh, at the university as the first, you know, he's called a chancellor, he's actually the first president. Uh, he gets here in um, 1852, and he announces that his inauguration. We can no longer just be a college. We have to be a university. And to be a university means we have to do research, we have to create new knowledge, and we have to have the instruments to create knowledge. And the idea was then to build a real world-class research facility, like the Detroit Observatory, to attract world-class researchers to come and do exactly that. I think both Tappan and Angel understood that to be a consequential university, that we had to have research at the core. And they understood what it took. I mean, the fact that we had this observatory on the campus, quite remarkable. It's called the Detroit Observatory because of the community of um, business people who worked with Tappan to build it. This was the time at which the railroads were really starting to become important in terms of commerce. And how were they going to prevent the trains from crashing into each other? They needed to have very accurate timekeeping. How were they going to get that accurate timekeeping? They would need observatories to actually set the time locally and coordinate it with all the other timekeeping locations. And so Tappan was able to go to the merchants of Detroit and suggest to them that didn't they need to have some kind of observatory to help set the time. Think about it, a giant telescope, one of the biggest of its kind at that time, to view the heavens, the sky. The sky's the limit. And uh, that's a wonderful metaphor for how we look at all of our endeavors here at Michigan, whether they're the humanities or the social sciences or the natural sciences and certainly for medicine. It actually led to, obviously, a heavy emphasis on laboratory um, experiences within the core curriculum, which was, was dramatic, transformative back then. Um, now it's second nature to what we do. It had a lot to do with the vision of Henry Philip Tappan, who was a philosopher and a clergyman who had sort of glimpsed the possibilities of this research university. But then it happened, the sort of realization of Tappan's vision of what the University of Michigan might be developed over a period of the next few decades, uh, principally under James Angel. So the timing of this is very interesting. So Michigan takes us to position in the 1870s that we're gonna be a place that promotes and supports research at the same time, of course, as we teach students. What that means then is that really talented faculty in other disciplines are going to be attracted to Michigan, history, philosophy, psychology. He believed in Tappan's vision of the university, and so he began to make crucial faculty hires, and those people uh, began to develop their disciplines, especially in the social sciences. And two of the most important people in the social sciences, for example, are going to be John Dewey, who actually comes out to be the professor of psychology and philosophy to begin with. He comes in the early 1880s. Um, and around the same time as Henry Carter Adams, who's the founder of the economics department, a very, very famous economist for his day. And these two people are going to have a huge formative influence on the birth of the social sciences here. ISR was kind of um, an accident after World War II with the rise of federal funding and other things for um, particularly for state institutions and their growth, a group of people who were in Washington were looking for a place to go. And ISR is an um, amalgamation of the Survey Research Center, which came, I think, in 1946, and the Research Center for Group Dynamics that came in 1948. And in 1949, they formed this thing called the Institute for Social Research. There's a book on its history, it's called A Telescope on Society, and that's really what the Institute for Social Research was doing. In a lot of ways, it's even a microscope on society. The things that they did with attitude surveys, um, quantitative analysis, just brought together a lot of the social disciplines. And these studies, the quality of life, consumer attitudes, uh, later evolved into political science research, the studies of the U.S. electorate. There's some really important work being done by the Institute for Social Research to understand what's going on in America. The University of Michigan was willing to let these people who were very uh, futuristic, thinking about what was going to be important for the future, establish 
the grounds for this tremendous work that's done. And, you know, the giants in that field have done work that is really important even today. Something attracted that particular group of people that uh, came to the Institute for Social Research to found it. You know, Angus Campbell and Rensis Lickert, Bob Kahn, Daniel Katz. These were people that I had the privilege of studying under. You know, they were sort of the gods. Look what they were able to accomplish. The people who came and founded the institution, uh, people like Campbell or Lickard, Cartwright, you know, that, that group of people, um, also had a kind of an academic perspective. It really tried to combine a kind of an entrepreneurial perspective and way of doing things with a true commitment to uh, intellectual development um, and a kind of an academic base. And, and the rest of it is just kind of history uh, as it grew to the largest social and behavioral science university-based institution in the world. One of the things that makes Michigan unique that you have in almost every department really some of the best people in the world and that is, I think, what draws in the best students in the world. Students should be looking out there into space, into the future. I think that's what we like to expose our students to as well, is that to you know, reach for the stars, so to speak, and have an open mind to new ideas and new methods and new techniques. That's the importance, I think, of, of individuals, not only those who are in the humanities, but also in the, in the sciences, to understand as part of your educational experience that science is part of everything we do in every aspect of our lives. Made possible by the Stanley and Judith Frankel Family Foundation.